So welcome all to the last last session of Data and Us. Um, it's been fun um, and we've learned a lot. Uh, I'll go through a bit of what we've done, but also I want to take this opportunity to thank Isenova at uh, Faculdade de Ciências Sociais e Humanas and YAD for supporting this initiative. And I also want to give a particular thank you to my co-organizers, uh, and that would be Professor Cristina Pont, who is here with us today. Um, she's a professor in the Department of Communication Sciences at uh, FCSH, and Professor Paulo Nun Vicente, uh, who is also a professor um, at uh, FCSH, and then my colleague um, Sofia Pont, who is a professor at YAD. And last but not least, a big, big, enormous thank you to Patricia Caneira. She's a doctoral student. She just received funding from the FCT to do her doctoral work. We're really excited that she could help us throughout this year. She's absolutely and was invaluable and uh, words cannot express how thankful we are for all your support and for always being there and for your smile and just, you know, in general, it's been amazing working with you and I want to make sure that we acknowledge that formally. It's been a nice uh, year and throughout this series the idea was always to look at the entanglements of data with our lives and we've done that in a series of ways. We've looked at data and us from the macro and the micro at the macro level, we looked at how the material infrastructure, so the very material infrastructure of the internet has been used and is being used for global surveillance purposes. And we've also looked at how that same infrastructure is used to datify our bodies and our domestic spheres from the ring uh, bell by Amazon to the, the datification of uh, the childhood um, to the use of apps to quantify our bodies. We've also looked at the material and the, discur the discursive constitution of AI. We've looked at how AI is figured as, the, as a child with lots of positive potential and how we are expected to look at it in this way, thus forgiving its errors, <clears throat> its errors and um, its negative effects. We've looked at how it is often discursively figured also as being both inevitable and um, a blessing, and how it generally tends to use an extractive logic rather than one of giving back. We've looked at the human and material tolls of machine learning and content moderation. And so as you can see, our mood has mainly been pessimistic though not without hope. And I think today's so last conversation with Chris will also be a bit between these two boundaries of being hopeful, but being uh, soberly so. It is a great, great pleasure to have Chris here today. It is also a great pleasure to have Eitor Alvelos um, helping us moderate. Etor is a professor of new media um, and he uh, has a really distinguished uh, and international career. So thank you Etor for being here today and for helping us do this. And thank you all. Um, I don't want, sorry, why isn't this? I don't, there. I don't want to spend too much time in introductions because you're not here to hear me, but to listen to our speaker. But I just want to say thank you on behalf of all the organization for, for attending, especially because Portugal is playing, but generally for being here, for supporting this. It's been a pleasure for us, and I hope you've enjoyed it. And you can see almost all the talks on our YouTube channel. So if you've missed some, you can see them there. So thank you, and I'll uh, give the words to Eitor, who will introduce our speaker. Thanks. There. Great, thank, thank you so much, and I hope you can hear me well. Yes. Fantastic. Uh, first of all, congratulations on a, on a truly impressive series. Uh, it's remarkable the work that you've done and uh, 
it's a shame that it's coming to an end today, but of course, Chris will be the one to end them all, really. That's my expectation. I'm, I'm, I'm sure not just mine. Uh, it's a great pleasure. Thank you uh, for the invitation and the honor. And I, I really want to thank the, the whole team of Data and us for this pleasure of hosting the session or moderating Sophia Pont, Anna Luz Vizio, Cristina Pont, Paolo Nun Vicent, and Patricia Canada. Again, congratulations. But uh, echoing Anna's words, it's really not about me today. So I think it's important that um, I point out that indeed we are facing a tough competition. But as I was saying just before we opened the uh, waiting room, the ones who want to be here, they really want to be here. So that makes for the ideal audience, I believe. Um, so without further ado, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Chris Csikszentmihalyi. I hope I pronounced the uh, surname correctly. I gave it a try. Self-described as an artist, an occasional scholar, technology critic, and technologist, Chris is currently the Associate Professor of Information Science at Cornell University. Um, I remember, if, if I recall correctly, we originally met at the Future Places Media Lab for Citizenship here in Portugal in 2015, where Chris provided a prescient keynote on the urgent roles that technology uh, should perform um, in order to improve the lives of citizens, communities, the social fabric in general. But his keynote was not just prescient, it was also tangible, and this was really most impressive. Chris was not just stating this urgency as this kind of motto, he was actually uh, putting it into practice, already engaged in multiple fronts that were making a difference even back then. So um, it's, I think, important to outline that Chris has... Uh, had a long and truly distinguished academic career that includes being a Radcliffe Fellow and a Rockefeller New Media Fellow. Uh, he has exhibited installations, performed on most continents, and he has been in the past the European Research Area Chair at the Madeira Interactive Technologies Institute, as well as spending 10 years at MIT's Media Lab. It was there that he founded and directed the Center for Future Civic Media and ran the famous or infamous, if you prefer, Computing Culture Group. These initiatives, as well as many others, such as the Free Root IO radio projects or the ProBots, these are robots that can be used by protesters who do not want to be clubbed by the police. They're really exemplary of Chris's particular kind of academics, uh, the kind where technology is both an actor and a research uh, location, central but not deterministic, neither neutral not, ut not utopian. In Chris's work, digital technologies emerge as a site for the creation of community, culture, and politics. It can be argued then that Chris was doing responsible research and innovation, as they say, and societal engagement, as they say as well, before it actually became cool or even mandatory as it is these days. And therefore, it is really his ability to um, perform this kind of social uh, technological thinking with critical making that makes him unique and that has a thrill to have him here. So without further ado, uh, Chris, it's great to see you again. Welcome. And I really look forward to what you have to share with us. And I think I echo everyone's sentiment in this room. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that was uh, such a lovely introduction. I'm really grateful. I'm grateful uh, also to uh, uh, Professor Vizu and uh, uh, all uh, everyone else uh, who who brought me. Really, really grateful. Uh, it's it's such an amazing lineup. As uh, uh, as Ator said, it, it, it's just a uh, um, it's an honor to be in this company. I know I know a lot of the people who were at Data Nest before, so um, I'm excited to uh, be part of this community. Um, so I'm going to be uh, uh, talking about um, essentially a, a technique that uh, I've been using for about 22 years now or so uh, around building small platforms. Um, just to be confirmed, everyone can see the slide. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Great. Thanks. Um, so uh, you know, th this is uh, uh, it, it's important uh, to to just describe that this is a process that. Uh, was rising along with what we come to know now as the platform economy, 
Um, so we were, I, I was I was from a more traditional art and design background, uh, uh, always using technology, but, uh, you know, uh, Natalie Bookchin was was uh, on the faculty where I did my degree, uh, who spoke earlier in the series. Um, and so, you know, we were imagining uh, much more kind of uh, single users and computers. And, but, you know, in the 1990s, late 1990s, the, the rise of the platform economy became uh, one of the dominant ways that we imagine computation. And so those early companies like um, eBay uh, were, were, were coming along and eventually uh, uh, people dubbed this Web 2.0 and this, this kind of process of interaction with, with platforms. Um, and what we started to see was, was the kind of the, the definition and formalization of the Silicon Valley model and the Silicon Valley economy. So today I'm going to try to talk through a little bit of what we learned as we saw the Silicon Valley uh, kind of platform economy rise. Um, and what we were doing uh, as kind of alternatives. And so this is kind of one, one slice through some of the, um, the work that I'm doing in the area. Um, so as Ator mentioned, uh, you know, I, I uh, am trained as an artist uh, more than as a scholar. Uh, and, and, and so I, I'm kind of a, a hybrid in that sense. Um, uh, my, my, my original profession was as a designer in a design consultancy. Um, uh, so, so the the roadmap of what we'll talk about uh, is is you know thinking about the big problem. Then I'll talk a little bit about Silicon Valley and platforms because this, of course, is you know what we're designing against. Let's say the the kind of the foil that we're um, working against in some form. Um, then I'll try to talk about a couple of key elements of uh, public good tech and how to uh, think about techniques and processes that let you escape the Silicon Valley formulation of how technology should be made. Um, uh, and then, then I'll talk specifically about as many examples of counter platforms as I can give in, you know, 35 minutes or so, um, uh, and, and just show, show some of uh, uh, the, the ones we've done. But let me, let me take a pause to just talk about the, the, the biggest problem, um, you know, the problem uh, and, and why, why I think it's important to, to question deeply our relationship to technology and data. Um, and you know this is this is the problem uh, that that the the fields of science uh, you know the the word scientist was coined around 1830 so the kind of professionalization of science um, and engineering which is an older term but really comes to become a, a very important part of how we think about our material culture and our definitions of society they really kind of come come about uh, in in the mid 1800s and during this period this was you know the uh, Tech Crunch Disrupt Conference uh, and like really all the other conferences combined. They were the the world fairs, um, and so whether in Paris or London or New York or um, uh, other places, this was where the world would come. Uh, uh, the the London World's Fair, uh, uh, where the Crystal Palace was developed, for example, um, some phenomenal number of uh, people in England went to visit it. Uh, something like uh, about half of all English people visit the World's Fair at some point. So it was. These were massive, massive undertakings, and, and they were where people showed the technology, they showed a new kind of vision of technology, uh, let's say directing so society on some level. And this is really the period where we start to identify our hopes and our dreams and our ambitions as something that can be realized through technology rather than through, through say through you know, God or through education or through um, uh, other forms of enlightenment. Technology becomes the kind of the, the signifier of, of how we put our hopes in society. Um, and always at the center in, in this image, you'll see there's this long building with these two smokestacks um, belching um, carbon. <laughs> um, and, and that's because these, um, uh, these World's Fairs were cities unto themselves and they needed essentially an electrical utility. Um, first, it, it was actually a mechanical utility uh, that would then power lots of things, but eventually it became electrical. And so we see the the kind of the the professions of engineering and science being co-created on some level, along with the the kind of understanding that, that this is all tied to carbon and to um, the expenditure of energy, the creation of utility by burning you know a dinosaur and forest uh, remnants from uh, millions of years ago, um, and and I think that these are these are so tightly coupled that it's almost impossible to figure out how to separate them, uh, and so we see. You know, the engineer is this kind of public good profession, but a public good profession which had one simple secret, you know, this one simple secret will advance society, which is um, uh, burning carbon for energy. 
Um, and just to you know, give a sense uh, of of how you know how important this this is. This is sort of the history of the world from um, you know here we see cattle are domesticated, so we have the vakash, um, and then uh, you know uh, we see um, uh, settlement in 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 rural China, um, the the mini ice age of cooling of of Europe, uh, copper gold, um, you know, and, and you can see that the temperature is always staying right here in this kind of light colored zone right in the middle of the screen. Uh, this is, of course, from the cartoonist XKCD. Here are the, the mummies, um, uh, Stonehenge uh, uh, being completed. And so you see all through the Olmec civilization, the Polynesian civilization, Zapotec writing, uh, all of these are coming along and it's all happening just right there. And then um, uh, uh, the European Renaissance, the Lars Age, and then boom, you know, all of a sudden everything is shifting. Right, uh, we've gone out of that safe zone, uh, uh, and and we're we're on a path to a world that, as humans, we've never ever experienced before, um, and 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 have no real preparation for. Um, and so, so I think it's really, and you know, it it just it 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 starts right here. <laughs> you can just see. Um, see the industrial revolution as kind of the beginning of the inflection point. Um, so you know the the very kind of centerpiece of 19th and 20th century progress, uh, uh, and still the kind of centerpiece of 21st century progress, carbon fuel powered engine is propelling us into this global catastrophe, and the engineering and innovation that helped us uh, until now may actually be really the problem. And I saw I've seen this over and over. Um, at MIT, for instance, uh, while I was there, the creation of the largest uh, new branch of MIT, the MIT Energy Initiative, and you saw one after another project uh, about energy transmission, energy uh, invention, energy transportation, uh, uh, all of these, but nothing around uh, uh, how to use less energy, nothing around conservation, um, simply kind of taking the existing industries, uh, Schlumberger and British Petroleum and all these other kinds of approaches towards uh, innovating technology and just saying, okay, let's let's do this more now. Let's, let's put even more money behind it. Um, and so the same kind of actors and the same kind of techniques. And, you know, this, this reminds me, of course, of, of uh, uh, the recently passed Bruno Latour, who, who has this quote, technology is society made durable, right? Um, uh, the point being that, that unless really amazing things are thrown into this, um, uh, thrown into the efforts, un unless there's a kind of a new politics around technology, we're simply going to kind of recreate the status quo, rebuild what we already have. And we see that even in, you know, what are supposed to be the most advanced technologies coming out, you know, the, the datafied um, uh, Tesla being one example, which, you know, seems like an electric car, but really it's, it's, it's a platform, and we can talk about that a little bit more, um, it's a, uh, as much an electric car as it is a data processing unit, uh, data analysis unit, and of course contributing to the Tesla platform in terms of pulling data. But when we see what, what it actually is, we see that uh, year after year when Tesla has uh, uh, reported its, its income, not even profits until recently, but income, the income primarily comes from selling uh, carbon credits to other companies. So it's it's actually in some ways accelerating climate change, even though it seems like a good idea. So there's there's lots that we can think about with the car. Why are we still driving alone? You know, um, why is this uh, innovation not put into public transport? Um, uh, what about, uh, uh, you know, what, if, if the same energy had been put into buses or trains, what would they look like now? Um, uh, so, so the question is, why does the design of new technologies for social change so rarely work? And, um, and, and so if Latour taught us that normal technology reifies power on some level, um, uh, it reproduces the status quo because the same kinds of people are putting uh, you know, energy and, and, and work into uh, new technologies that put it into it before, what are ways that we can kind of escape this pattern on some level? Um, uh, it requires very different techniques and very hard work um, to innovate how we need to innovate to kind of um, uh, survive as a planet. And what we've been trying to do is essentially uh, in, in my various research groups is try to take the kind of mainstream development of technology, which you know recently has been the platform economy, um, and to try to understand how do we actually do that hard work of innovating differently and putting different values into the technology itself. 
Um, and I think, you know, I think that the challenge is, is perhaps best summarized by um, uh, uh, Kentaro Toyama um, at the University of Michigan, who makes this uh, kind of dichotomy between regular design of technology versus technology for social change. And he describes the, a chasm between the values of classical design and what's required for meaningful social change. So what does that mean? Um, it means basically that, that regular design uh, especially, you know, if you think about human-centered design as the basis of, of so much technology that comes out now, uh, it, it's basically trying to help people do what they're already doing better, more seamlessly, um, more efficiently. And so, again, you know, uh, going back to the World's Fair, that's really what the carbon economy helped us do, is figure out how to save labor. Uh, you know, you don't have to carry people on a palanque anymore. You can have a car, an automobile. Um, you don't need to feed horses, you can build uh, transportation systems. And so this kind of efficiency of solving existing challenges without having people change too much what they're doing, um, sort of a substitution act, is what traditional design is. But social change requires people to change, right? It's not substituting what people are already doing. It's, it's actually changing what they're doing. And, and that's a very different process. And so he makes this argument that actually to do social change, you, you really can't use any of the principles of design that we think we've learned, um, uh, technology and design. So, um, you know, from this, uh, I, I would say that one of the things that we've learned is that you actually have to actively invert power relationships to innovate for social good. Um, you have to figure out how to rethink about the same situation where you're enabling a different set of people differently than other people are enabling. And, you know, just a, an image that I like to uh, to, to use in, in describing what this kind of rethinking uh, uh, requires is is this kind of image. And you've seen you've seen this image a million times, I'm sure, uh, in one form or another. This one is is showing electricity, but this could be network connectivity. It could be income. It could be all of these things. But let's just say electricity, which you know, for most of most of the the last hundreds of years, has been uh, identified with with development, with progress. Um, and so, you know, to understand uh, how to reimagine that kind of vision of progress, you kind of have to invert it and just say, okay, here, uh, the lighter areas are the more virtuous areas of the world, right? Um, if, if, in fact, we all lived like sub-Saharan Africans, um, we wouldn't be facing anything near the, the kind of climate crisis that we're facing at the moment. And so, so, you know, your goals and your ambitions as a technologist have to change appropriately to, to, to recognize that this is where we're going to find inspiration in Central Africa, in the Andes, in, the, in, in you know, in, in South America. How do we, uh, you know, look at what technologies people have and are using there and, uh, and, and understand and appreciate the benefits and the values of those, um, of those lifestyles, of those ways of being, so that we can integrate that into future versions of technology. And in fact, these black areas like, you know, the East Coast of the United States, where I live, um, uh, we, we want to actively be saying we should not be designing for this lifestyle that we have here. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, uh, it's time, it's time in a way to understand knowledge and, uh, you know, from radicals and unexpected places. And I've been primarily doing the former, but I will say that one aspect of my work, which is still fairly fresh is, uh, you know, working with Steve Jackson, um, Marina Zafiris, one of my PhD students, around trying to understand better uh, uh, indigenous knowledge, indigenous ontologies, indigenous lifestyles um, as a way of, of challenging to say, how can we design technologies around that? And I'll show, I'll show kind of parallel related work. Um, so uh, this next section um, you know, is, is a question about where is the data harvested and um, uh, where, you know, who, who created uh, this, this platform economy that we know that's pulling our data, using it for different ways. And, um, uh, and, and uh, uh, you, you've learned a lot about it over the course of these weeks with these different presentations. Um, you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's a complicated space, but you know, I guess what I'm trying to point out in this section is just how much of it is um, arbitrary and how much of it is uh, oriented towards the old fashioned design models that, that I think we need to challenge and to, to think about. Um, so you know, uh, one of the one of the especially when I'm talking uh, to people outside of the United States, um, you know, I I, I recognize that it, it's very possible to end up being a colonist for Silicon Valley ideas. 
Um, uh, this kind of colonization happens around the world, uh, you know, to uh, Paris and, and uh, Beijing or Shenzhen as much as uh, uh, to anywhere else. Um, and, and, and I think, you know, it's, it's really critical to understand a little bit better the culture of Silicon Valley. There, there's been this attempt to recreate Silicon Valley and, you know, the engine that created the platform economy in other places. And there are consulting companies and experts like John Chambers who uh, go around the world and try to explain why it's important for others to innovate in the style of Silicon Valley. Um, and so, you, you know, uh, early on in New York, there was the Silicon Alley. Um, uh, in Kenya, the Silicon Savannah, um, uh, uh, the Silicon Wadwa in, in, uh, in Israel, or uh, Yakai Tech in uh, South America and Ecuador, um, all of these attempts. And as um, one journalist uh, described it, um, uh, this is the World uh, Bank working in Africa, creating tech innovation startups with the hope that somehow Africa will be able to innovate its way out of uh, you know, relative poverty. Um, if only they uh, figure out the Silicon Valley method. Um, and as one uh, tech review journalist described, you know, uh, sadly, the magic hasn't happened anywhere. <laughs> Hundreds of regions all over the world collectively spend tens of billions of dollars to try to build their versions of Silicon Valley, and they didn't know of a single success. And um, that's still kind of the case. That doesn't mean that there's not really interesting technology being developed. It doesn't mean there's not like, uh, you know, really relevant and interesting stories to learn from other parts of the world. But what's what's misspent is this energy of trying to imitate on some level. So Silicon Valley can't be reproduced. And you know the question is, why is that? Um, I, I think probably the best answer that we've had is Marianne Mazzucato, um, who I think many of you will know, um, uh, who brings a, a particularly European perspective to the analysis of Silicon Valley. Um, and uh, and and what she wanted to understand was, you know, where where is the Silicon magic, Silicon Valley magic happening? what's what's going on with it? Um, and so she, in particular, you know, did a close analysis uh, of the of the smartphone, the the, the Apple iPhone, um, and she found that you know so much of it was actually dependent on uh, significant and sustained government uh, uh, research that was then commercialized and privatized, but that Silicon Valley did very little of it. So, for instance, internet access was a, a product of DARPA research, as we all know. Um, GPS grew out of the Department of Defense's Navstar project. Uh, uh, touchscreen technology was funded by the CIA and the National Science Foundation, um, and you know this is this is after uh, hundreds of years of uh, San Francisco being a center of defense technology for the United States. So if you know San Francisco, you know in the middle of the city there's this beautiful Telegraph Hill, which was named for the first Trans-Pacific Telegraph. Um, but again, you know, driven entirely by military funding, and 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 so this idea that you can take these um, uh, these these very very fine late stage uh, innovations and somehow uh, reproduce them or or learn from them, uh, you know, outside of Silicon Valley, is ignoring the fact that um, you know uh, Silicon Valley doesn't really do a lot of technical innovation. Um, in fact, where the innovation happens is entirely in what Kentaro Toyama talked about, that kind of user experience side of things. So you take those fundamental technologies and then you figure out a way that it can seamlessly help someone do business on a phone or seamlessly travel across the city through a uh, illegal co competition to a taxi service or things like that, right? So um, Silicon Valley, like if it weren't for breaking laws, they'd be really hard pressed to do a lot of the innovations that we've seen over the last years. Um, uh, they're they're kind of the lemon squeezed on the concha. I mean, it's wonderful. It's 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 it adds so much to it, um, but uh, but it's not uh, you know it's not the actual concha. And and so so understanding this, you know, we start to look at the the various people like Travis Kalanick who promised um, that uh, uh, Uber would decrease uh, congestion, reduce the ownership of private cars. And none of this has come to pass, right? I mean, all the all the studies have shown that Uber has increased traffic and congestion, um, uh, as well as uh, you know destabilized a lot of existing industries. Um, uh, obviously, Elizabeth Holmes, um, we, we know well. Um, uh, Elon Musk, uh, uh, you know, promised green automobiles, as we saw, they didn't really come out. Um, and of course, uh, Sam Bankman fried uh, independent from. Uh, he, he promised independence from extractive banking, you know, and 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 stability through not being involved in the government, and we can see what happened. So, um, you know, I, I think that the, the as we look at, at at data and the platform economies, we have to understand, you know, not just in the particulars of data and platforms, 
but really in the particulars of business model and tech innovation and things like that, that th these are folks who don't have much to offer. And, um, you know, uh, uh, I can I can kind of describe a little bit of that personally. Um, we know that Jack Dorsey is often credited with creating Twitter, um, uh, but uh, uh, while that was happening, um, uh, I was running this research group at MIT, and one of my students, Tad Hirsch, uh, who uh, was an artist and a designer with a master's from CMU and uh, uh, doing a second master's at MIT and then eventually a PhD at MIT, he was really interested in the Battle of Seattle, and, and he was taking this inversion of power idea very seriously, uh, and so he wanted to uh, uh, figure out if the police were using advanced uh, weapons, especially under the Bush administration, there was kind of a funnel from the Department of Defense and US military to the police forces. It was becoming almost impossible for protesters to find ways to protest. Um, could he build a system that used a ubiquitous uh, new technology of smartphones that people were wearing in order to help the protesters bypass police techniques? And so he created um, this, uh, uh, system in the summer between his master's and his PhD called Text Mob, right before the Republican National Convention of 2004. Um, and, you know, it, it proved to be very successful in setting down the city. Um, uh, Wired wrote about it. Uh, and then the Wall Street Journal wrote about it. And this is all running from a little server um, under, under my office desk uh, uh, in, in the my, MIT Media Lab. Um, and some of you might have read about this in Design Justice or a couple of other books have started to cover it now. But at the time, we didn't really know too much of the story, except that uh, in, in when the Wall Street Journal started writing about the phone systems um, that we were using to uh, coordinate the protesters or to help the coordinators protest themselves, that help the protesters coordinate themselves, um, we were uh, we were covered by the Wall Street Journal, who started calling the phone companies and saying, "Are you uh, familiar with this SMS-based texting service that's helping the protesters bypass the police?" And gradually, the phone companies started shutting down our service. And so um, uh, uh, we basically, uh, we, we were left with this kind of question. And Tad started looking to say, what can I do in the courts? What can I do in the legal system to reopen the service for the protesters? Well, we only had like three or four days of the, of the convention left um, for the protesters to use it. Um, and so we put out a call for people to help build a proxy system and uh, and and so this is like what protesters in Iran use, uh, a way that our servers wouldn't be identified by the phone companies as the origin of the texts that were being sent. And so to distribute lots and lots of servers to do this. And the people who helped uh, do this turned out to be really interesting people uh, from a small company called Odeo, as well as some others. Um, and Odeo was facing this challenge because their uh, podcasting business model was uh, in decline. Uh, Apple had just created its own podcasting service, and so they needed to pivot. And so gradually what happened is they, um, they, they started doing these workshops to try to understand uh, what they could pivot to. And because a bunch of them had just helped with um, the text mob deployment in the proxy system, they demoed that for the company. And um, uh, uh, they, they later admitted um, only in 2013, 2014 did we understand what had happened. Um, they later admitted that they basically took the uh, the source code of text mob and the ideas um, and turned it directly to Twitter. So you see, this is uh, the person who hired Jack Dorsey saying, the idea of Twitter came from a Hackaday project of Jack, Noah Glass, and Florian Weber, but they were all aware of text mob as we'd done a presentation and evaluation of text mob a few days earlier. So they literally took the source code um, and produced the first version of Twitter as a result. As a result. So I'd like everyone now to um, join me in a small uh, game show. Uh, and uh, can you still hear me, or is the music too loud? Okay, so um, uh, if, if everyone could raise their hand, um, uh, the game show is called um, Musk or Burns, um, and so I'd like you to imagine um, uh, which who, who made these quotes, and we'll just look at your show of hands, um, uh, and I think I've got the right window open. So um, here's a quote. Uh, can you tell if this was um, Mr. Burns, the cartoon villain of The Simpsons, or Elon Musk. Um, if there is the way that I could not eat so that I could work more, I would not eat. So can we see a show of hands for uh, Burns? Seeing about five. Okay, Musk. We're going to do this quickly. Um, take your hand down if you said Burns and raise your hand if you said Musk. Okay, more people saying Musk, it looks like. Okay. Um, it was, in fact, Elon Musk. Okay. 
um, I should be able to run over as many kids as I want. Is this Elon Musk or uh, Mr. Burns? Uh, so Mr. Burns first, raise your hand. Okay. Uh, seeing 16. Okay, Musk, uh, raise your hand. The pioneer of the electric car. Okay, interesting. Uh, so, so you got it right. It is, in fact, Mr. Burns, who drives a Tesla, though I should, I should mention. Um, uh, this is my lesson for taking a vacation. Vacations will kill you. Uh, Burns? Looks like about uh, 12, 14 for Burns, maybe. Okay, uh, Musk? Take your hand down if you said Burns. Let's see, Musk. Got about 15 cents. It's a tie. Uh, in fact, it is Elon Musk. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, let, let's. Uh, I'll just kind of go a little bit more quicker and just remember yourself. Family, religion, friendship. These are the three demons you must slay if you wish to succeed in business. Um, uh, that was, in fact, uh, Mr. Burns. Pronouns suck. Um, that's Elon Musk. And she said no to me. Do you know how many women have said no to me? 130, but only once since I've become a billionaire. Um, Mr. Burns. So I do this in, with my students and, and almost no one, uh, like, no one can do three quotes successively without getting it wrong. Um, so uh, uh, I, I guess what I'm trying to point out is that real innovation is already coming from unexpected places, not from Silicon Valley CEOs. Um, and, uh, you know, if you're interested in technology innovation, you have to start looking uh, at other places. So let's now talk about three key elements for public good work, because it's really clear that public good issues aren't going to be solved by cartoonish characters like Mr. Burns or Elon Musk. Um, uh, you know, who, who else is going to um, uh, uh, actually do that work? And so um, uh, I, I point to examples like um, this one. Uh, this is uh, the Google Maps of uh, Monterey, Mexico, where I was last week. Um, and you can see the kind of the detail and the quality of the map. Um, it's, it's excellent. We all use Google Maps all the time. Um, uh, and, but we can also see that in the end, uh, to be able to use this data, you have to go through a pretty bizarre kind of set of uh, copyrights and uh, intellectual property. And so um, uh, what, we, what we've seen uh, you know, since, since the mid-1990s is the advancement of uh, uh, other types of licensing and approaches towards development. And this, for example, is the Linux um, uh, kernel that's being developed by uh, Linus Torvalds and others. Um, uh, you can see this is the year 2009, the number of people involved. Um, and there are almost as many organizations or companies as people involved, but they're, they're, the Linux did not have a company. Um, and so you see already that this is a, a, a radically different shift than with anything we've seen before, where people around the world can collaborate on technologies that are kind of public good technologies like Linux um, and use a variety of software like version control systems, et cetera, to try to do this work agnostic of the market. Not to say that many of these people aren't working for a job or using Linux in their business, but it's agnostic of market forces on some level. So very different from um, Silicon Valley. And we've seen um, Eric von Hippel and others basically point out that there are kind of different models uh, in organizations science. One is the private investment model like Silicon Valley. The other is a collective action model. And, and so the kind of small platforms that we've been developing tend to leverage this collective action model like open source software. Or like this person who was really interested in developing software that used maps, but found that he couldn't you know, pay Google um, uh, he, you know, as a startup in the UK, there wasn't government data that allowed him to use public interest maps. Um, and so he started organizing uh, these kind of street parties where people would walk down the street with GPS units um, and gradually build uh, maps collaboratively. It was a kind of a very nerdy activity, but um, very quickly showed amazing kind of promise as people were gradually developing uh, so this is the Monterey, Mexico uh, with OpenStreetMap, this alternative to Google that is uh, a free and open alternative um, that's been developed uh, by people who are interested in being able to use maps. OpenStreetMap has been tremendously successful in uh, places like uh, Kabul, um, uh, places like Haiti, uh, when the Port-au-Prince earthquake happened, OpenStreetMaps was uh, by far the most active and recent map that was used in the disaster response and recovery. Um, done through a completely, again, a completely different model. Lots of businesses use OpenStreetMaps, um, but, uh, but it's not a business in and of itself. Um, and you can see that 
um, uh, instead of having a copyright, it asks you to make a donation um, and tells you what the API terms are that you can use the data for free. And uh, you know, uh, this is a video of kind of OpenStreetMap development in the um, in the knots to the early 2010s. And you can see just around the world maps being developed uh, uh, for kind of citizens' interests and community-based interests. Um, so you know, one of the one of the most important aspects of what makes uh, small platforms possible are these free libre intellectual property and related methods of developing and coordination and communication by people who are working on public good issues um, around the world. Um, so these are collaborators, sometimes companies, but not only companies, but uh, lots of collaborators and citizens working. Um, we saw uh, uh, in the in the mid uh, in the 2010s, we saw work by a couple of people around Mechanical Turk that offers one vision of small platforms. Um, this was Lily Arani and uh, Six Silberman, who were looking at uh, a very prevalent uh, digital labor uh, technique that, um, uh, uh, sorry, um, that uh, uh, called Amazon Mechanical Turk, and I think many of you are familiar with it. It's sort of like a a platforms platform, let's say, um, where uh, it, it, it creates a marketplace between people uh, doing work um, and people needing work done. That's online work that can be divided into small programs, what um, uh, people call human computation, uh, Louis Vanon and others call human computation tasks. And you know, when you look at um, when you look at the uh, the graphics that Amazon produces, you see these requesters who have tasks they need to be completed, and you see these workers who want to earn money. And MTurk becomes the marketplace, the the platform put in between them, which dictates the rules of business, um, uh, which dictates uh, you know uh, what is uh, legal and not legal on the you know in the terms of the platform. Um, and I'm sure you've had prior talks in this series about platform economy and how it works. Um, but, uh, but you know, Amazon always produces this very kind of uh, lovely model. Um, Iranian Silberman describe it as a micro labor marketplace, a crowdsourcing platform, a source of human computation resources. And again, you know, when Amazon describes it, it, it kind of gives it this lovely image of the cloud on the blue sky, you know, and these workers and these um, projects, uh, uh, all, the, all the graphics oriented towards management typically, um, uh, you know, because that's ultimately who they see as their customer. But what Lillian Arani saw was that uh, Turk workers were incredibly uh, uh, unhappy with the labor practices. And you know, so uh, Lily Arani and, and Six Silberman had this kind of question: like, we want to kind of get involved in Amazon Turk. We want to figure out how workers can be empowered better. We want to change this platform, but changing platforms is incredibly difficult to do, as Elon Musk is discovering now. Um, there's a huge amount of inertia. It's very difficult to do it. Um, and so they came up with a strategy of creating a parallel platform, uh, uh, which they called um, uh, Turkopticon which basically allows workers to organize, which allows them to gather data about what Amazon the Turk is doing, and ultimately to, to gather data about which employers are shafting workers, are uh, withholding pay, are doing all of these things that uh, workers were complaining about Amazon Turk, but which because Amazon owned the platform, it wasn't allowing any of that data out. It wasn't allowing people to aggregate it or to have access to it. And so Ronnie and Silberman essentially created a parallel platform which workers could use which would allow them to put all that data somewhere. Um, and this was an incredibly important kind of discovery. Um, uh, they, they say that you know, it's a kind of a case study and intervention in a highly distributed microlabor system, um, an example of systems designing incorporating tools like feminist analysis and reflexivity, um, but also uh, you know, um, uh, a lot, how to, how to uh, basically address issues in large scale technical platforms by building smaller but but custom made platforms that people would want to contribute to and work with, that then pulls the data um, that otherwise would be hidden and inaccessible uh, for for users or workers or others. Um, and so, you know, this this work I think was kind of uh, groundbreaking. We were doing similar work, uh, similar on counter platforms uh, or earlier counter platforms that can be designed around or beneath existing platforms to modify or ameliorate their effects. And so you're basically saying, how do you get data for the public good? You get it by designing these kind of small counter platforms. Um, so, you know, some examples of ones that we did uh, starting around 2007, uh, uh, we were looking at the resource curse, which typically people associate with Nigeria or, you know, uh, uh, other kind of global South places. 
But in the United States, fracking was booming so much in 2007, 2008, that we were seeing people's houses explode, pipeline explosions. It was this massive growth of uh, essentially a methane economy that we know now was a, a terrible misuse of uh, uh, technological priorities. All the states and the federal government were keeping massive platform databases of what was happening with these problems, but they were completely opaque to users, and they really only had information that was defined by the needs of the government on one side and industry on the other. And so these two uh, forces were constantly uh, in battle to try to figure out uh, what kind of data will we allow to be represented, do we need to be represented, um, but for actual people working in the communities or, or living in the communities where this uh, explosions were happening, there was almost no data that they had access to, and certainly it was opaque. Um, and so with uh, Sarah Wiley, uh, through, through a project called Fractivism, we started developing a set of micro platforms, uh, small platforms that would help communities. So this, for example, was a way of uh, reviewing industry employees when they would come to your house or deal with crises. How do you uh, consistently show who works for industry and what decisions they're making um, so that 10 or 15 years later, an, another person who's dealing with that industry employee has a record of what they've done and how they've worked with the community and whether they've been honest dealers or not. Um, also, WellWatch, which basically scraped state databases, which really only had kind of tax relevant, VAT relevant information on wells and what was going on with it and basically allowed them to put their own images, uh, videos, uh, narratives, diary uh, uh, diary notices of what was happening um, uh, uh, in the community. Another project, uh, which uh, I know Heitor has seen many times, but uh, is still very active and, and constantly being developed, um, uh, is had to do with Google Maps and how Google Maps tended to focus on uh, the richest part of the world with the highest resolution images and many other parts of the world were not getting uh, the kind of data that, uh, that that Google was providing to other people. Um, uh, and that's because Google, you know, basically has these hundred million dollar, you know, uh, satellites that that go up and, and take images. Um, and so they have to recoup their, you know, their, their commercial loss. But Jeff Warren and a bunch of other people started uh, recognizing that you don't need a satellite necessarily to take uh, images uh, from above. Um, and so what they would do is use uh, kites and balloons uh, in order to, uh, uh, in basically disposable digital cameras, in order to take images of areas. So this is, for instance, them working on the BP oil spill uh, as, as it was destroying fisheries and coastland. Um, and so he jokingly called this one satellite per child uh, to kind of uh, make fun of Nicholas Negroponte, our boss at the time. Um, and, uh, and sure enough, uh, every time you fly it, kids flock from all over the neighborhood to help create these maps because of course they're flying balloons and kites, they love it. Um, but those maps then belong to the community afterwards. They can choose whether or not to put them online, they can choose what to use them for. Um, and so this, for example, is a neighborhood in Peru which was developing an address system based on their mapping systems. So gradually this became a nonprofit called um, Public Lab of Technology and Science uh, as other people joined. Um, and PLOTS basically has created the largest uh, 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 you know, uh, nonprofit data sets around environmental questions or damages um, uh, that have ever been created. Um, so this is, for example, the oil spill hitting a, 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 a bird preserve, a nature preserve um, in, the, in the Gulf Coast, and you can see the oil coming on shore. And so gradually as they started showing these images in, in legal trials and, and in court cases uh, with what was the largest visual database created around the BP oil spill, uh, 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 not just public, but the largest visual database, um, uh, you know, they, they started running into issues where people would say, oh, but what if that's not oil in the, in the, in the, um, the, the court proceeding? And so they started developing spectrograms and developing, you know, high quality ways of determining what the actual material that was spreading was. And so they gradually, they've worked on endocrine disruption, all these other areas. Um, uh, and, uh, and, uh, you can actually see when we first showed this to Google, they kind of laughed and they said, oh, you know, our satellites are much better than your kites. But they now show public lab data um, in Google Maps. And so if you go to places where people have done these community-oriented mapping sessions, you can actually see 10,000 times the spatial resolution and often much many years more recent um, data. So that's me in the orange shirt. Um, and uh, unfortunately, I was flying right when school let out. So I was you know, mobbed by like 40 people. Um, but, uh, but it was a lot of fun. And, and you know, this is uh, a youth center where in the end, this 
map. They used it as a way to start negotiating with neighbors around access and rights and things like that. Um, so these small platforms, uh, 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 especially when you when you think about community science and technology rather than citizen science and technology, which tends to be kind of in the interest of the scientists, community science and technology platforms are, tend to be in the interest of the community. And um, and so we're we're seeing a, a very different kind of approach towards gathering information and saving data um, uh, through those kinds of methods. I'm just going to show one more thing really quick, uh, um, just because most of these are kind of older projects. Um, I want to show um, uh, what we're working on at the moment. So uh, again, uh, I ended up moving um, uh, to uh, back to the United States from Madeira, um, and uh, one of the things that I noticed was that several power plants. Um, which had been closed uh, because there were coal power plants or uh, inefficient uh, power plants for natural gas had been closed in the area. Uh, and uh, and the, the region where I'm living, they're gradually starting to open these power plants, but not to produce power for communities that need it, but rather to produce Bitcoin. And so what they're doing is they're taking coal power plants that are no longer viable and, and actually in some cases no longer legal to produce energy with, but they have gotten special exceptions to produce Bitcoin with it. Um, and so, uh, in particular, there's a, a, a lake near, near where I live uh, called Lake Seneca, um, where Greenage, uh, this one power plant, has um, uh, been producing Bitcoin and raising the levels of the lake, this beautiful lake nearby, to the point of toxic algae blooms where no one can swim in it, uh, it becomes dangerous for drinking, it's killing the animals within the lake. Um, and so we started saying, can we leverage some of these community-based science approaches? We very quickly met a bunch of um, activists who were protesting Greenage, uh, and they were they were fixated on this question of measuring temperature. Um, but what they would do is they would go out and they would put uh, thermometers uh, in different places on the lake, and then uh, they would find that uh, the thermometers would disappear very quickly or be vandalized. Um, and they believe that it's Greenage doing that. Meanwhile, Greenage has been asked by the government to take uh, data of the lake temperature, but no one trusts the data that Greenage is, is um, taking. And in fact, for two years, at the end of the two years, they've said, oh, we know we had a year to measure the temperature, but there was an error, and so we have nothing to show you. And so their license keeps getting renewed. Um, so we've been basically going out with very inexpensive thermal cameras uh, in the kind of couple hundred dollar range uh, and kites to measure um, uh, temperature. Um, and I think most recently we've been um, uh, uh, building, because we don't want Greenwich to destroy our systems, uh, uh, you know, and, and we see this as really a kind of a hostile from below approach. We've built this robotic goose, which the real goose is finding very suspicious and, and <laughs> uh, trying to attack, uh, that's, that's going around the Greenwich site and taking temperature levels um, all the time. And then also parking by the Greenwich thermometers so that we can uh, kind of ground truth and check what's going on with them. Um, and so here you can see kind of successful line following uh, as we're doing it um, in Greenwich. So um, small platforms are a key tool for public good approach to technology, platforms that collect and leverage uh, data in the interest of citizens that are very different from the data that's interesting to companies or to governments can be a powerful approach to activism. Um, and that's 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 it for now, Muito obrigado. Um, thank you so much. Happy to take questions from Etor and others. Thank you so much, Chris. Very inspiring as usual. Um, and it just, um, I think, wakes up the uh, desire uh, in each one of us to join the ranks and make a difference in all of these uh, ways that you've um, brought us as, as examples of how the world could and should be. Um, I have a question, um, maybe maybe to to begin this conversation, and it has to do with the fact that, um, despite um, I think, um, despite the fact that we all agree that these projects are incredibly important, and that um, a key component of their success is actually the scale, as you pointed out the scale that needs to be multiplied and diversified according to different contexts and challenges. Um, could there be that there's um, a lack of a pedagogy, um, a broader pedagogy on how to engage in these kinds of ways? You know, um, what I see here are the, are the kinds of projects that uh, people who are engaging in um, um, an education that is essentially technologically based will be able to uh, create and develop and engage with. 
I'm not so sure about other areas. I think there's probably a kind of a disempowerment when you reach the social sciences, humanities, even the arts, uh, to an extent. Um, how do you see a pedagogy of this kind of practice uh, existing? So yeah, no, great, great question. And I mean, I think you'll see that with uh, a lot of the the projects I've shown, you know, Tad Hirsch, for instance, was, uh, you know, uh, heavily involved as an artist while doing, you know, also an HCI master's, right? Um, uh, Ryan McKinley, who did another project that didn't show called Open Government Information Awareness was a dual computer science and art major. Um, uh, so, so, and, and, and Jeff Warren with the more recent kind of uh, grassroots mapping approach um, was a design student uh, doing a master's uh, with Natalie Jermajenko before he came to MIT, right? So, so we are um, at the moment drawing heavily from uh, the kind of art and design side because those people are kind of socially activated. And so, you know, my my scholarly trajectory has been through Red Square Polytechnic, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, um, now Cornell in an information science department where almost all of my colleagues. Uh, well, let's say 70% uh, uh, of my colleagues are from computer science, electrical engineering. So I've been basically trying to get into places where I could, um, you know, corrupt young engineering students um, uh, towards the good, uh, <laughs> um, you know, groom them, as we say in America right now, uh, to uh, to public good questions. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, that that has been really interesting because I've seen time and again, there are lots of students from engineering from different kinds of majors who are really receptive to this idea and really interested. But mm -hmm. I think higher up, you know, you go to what those students expect to do when they enter an engineering program or, or um, yeah. kind of a traditional technology program, they have this ideology of Silicon Valley, right? So they, they, yeah. they, that is the, the limit of their vision of what they could do, um, you know, and, and it's only when there's kind of a shock to the system Mm. that you see their 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 view kind of change a little bit. And I think the tech lash of the last three, four years mm. has actually put a lot of them on a path towards um, trying to find different meaning within their technology. Mm -hmm. But we've seen that before, you know, in May 1968, you know, uh, one of the big protests was against the kind of perception that the world was going into a kind of a technocracy. Um, mm. uh, you, you had, uh, you know, uh, industry leaders and technical uh, efficiency experts leading the Vietnam War, um, you know, in Paris, it was this idea of a technocratic state. Um, and so, so we've seen, you know, really when I was a baby was the last time we've seen a, a kind of a similar tech lash that was like profound enough to actually impact engineering. Mm -hmm. um, maybe the environmental movement of the 70s, but I really see that as kind of an outgrowth of May 1968 and those kinds of changes. Mm -hmm. So, so I think it's, I think we have this period of a couple of years where things are kind of loose and they haven't, they haven't gelled yet that we have to do extraordinary work to try to make sure that it gels in the right direction. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, if you look at say Fred Turner's work or, um, you know, others who've, uh, uh, the, 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 the California ideology, other work that showed what happened in the 1960s and how that kind of turned into the Silicon Valley ideology, um, you know, the chance of it going in the wrong direction, even with this opportunity that we have of the tech clash, is way higher than the chance that it'll end up in a good direction, right? So, right. so I think it's it's a really critical time where I, I would just say we have to, um, you know, form a, a union of the social sciences, critical technology studies, STS, uh, uh, you know, and then any any engineering any engineer who's willing to listen, you know, and and kind of you know allow you to to access their students. This is a critical time to do that work. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, it's interesting that you were um, showing um, um, among your slides, you were showing an image of a magic trick, if I'm not mistaken, if I understood correctly what that desk was about on MTurk, I think it was the slide. But um, that reminded me of something that I think connects with what you just said, and it has to do with the ideological component that is actually happening uh, amongst all this. Would you agree that um, uh, the greatest magic trick of, of the current times is precisely creating the illusion or convincing people that we are in a post-ideological world and uh, actually there's an absence of ideology when actually the absence of ideology is in itself an ideology and uh, that could be argued in, in the present times. Uh, yeah, I mean, absolutely. There's uh, uh, a great quote from Peter Thiel who, who you know, he said this several times actually, where he says that 
we're in a, a race, a battle between technology and politics. Hmm. And, uh, you know, that it's important that technology win this battle from his perspective. And, um, and you know, so he's basically saying that this is the justification for why Uber or Airbnb can break laws in the different places that they go to can, can be completely disrespectful of, you know, cultural difference or norms because the technology has to win against what he sees as you right. know, politics in this kind of diminished way. You know, if, if you're to ask me, I think we're in a battle of humanity against its prior decisions, um, right? And and uh, um, and that, that this is a battle that we need all aspects of human society to come together on, whether it's mm. the politics, which is absolutely key and important. And, you know, I, I think, I think you, you, you know, what, what's really funny is that they're not, they're not, um, they're not making it up. They're not. They're not lying about this belief that that politics is less important than technology. And if you look at mm. Musk, the way he's you know trashing Twitter at the moment is just a great example where he doesn't understand that you know uh, politics means how do you deal with terrorists posting beheading videos on Twitter, right? I mean, this is a political question. How do you deal with uh, requests from the FBI or you know uh, the CIO in Zimbabwe? For private information about Twitter units, that mm -hmm. users, that's 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 politics, right? right. And he, he fired all the people who do any of that work, right? So so you know so there's there's it, it's it's simply that they've they, they've they've drunk their own Kool Aid for you know uh, you know 30, 40 years, and they actually don't see politics in this kind of interesting way. They just assume that libertarianism is the right approach, right. Um, but that means that they're like far less capable at leading these companies than they should be. You look at Mark Zuckerberg; he's clueless. He's completely he, had, he has no idea what he's done, and he has no idea where to go. And you know, and and uh, and so so I, I what I explain to the engineering students who often think that I'm being too political, and they don't really believe that. That the work that they're doing is political. I just say, look, you don't want to end up like Mark Zuckerberg, right? Like at the least, understand the politics well enough that you won't make these kinds of tragic mistakes that these guys are making. And end up looking like a cartoon character, too. Yeah. too. Yeah. <laughs> as, you, as you mentioned. Um, yeah. One one final question for me, and then I think we can probably open up uh, to um, the other participants. Um, one concern of mine is um, I think everyone agrees that public good is obviously a good idea but what happens really when public good clashes with personal comfort um you know we agree with this in theory but um, often when it comes down to it it is about our kind of mundane kind of uh, existence isn't it and uh, a lot of people i think are simply not motivated to give up on certain uh, comforts in their lives for a greater good um how do we manage this? How how do we recruit people, as you were saying before? How do we overcome this issue? Yeah, no, great question. And I, I think that, you know, maybe, uh, I'm not sure which is the, the best magic trick ever, but I, I think, you know, one, one magic trick is um, diminishing our kind of vision of the future to, you know, this incredibly short period. And, you know, if you look at kind of public discourse and debate uh, 150 years ago, you saw people developing the roads of, you know, Lisbon and the sewage systems of New York and these other kinds of incredible, you know, investment in public infrastructure. And I think part of the magic trick that, uh, you know, uh, let's let's say most recently we could call it neoliberalism, but it, um, it it's taken many faces over the years has convinced of us, us of is that, you know, we, we don't really need to think about our future as a society. We just have to kind of look at these, you know, a, a amazing innovations that are going to happen in the two to three year period. And I think that this has really kind of undercut the, the, the dialogue around citizenship, public good, um, you know, societal collaboration on the future. Uh, so, so to me, you know, th this is part of why I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm actively trying to understand what is coming out of uh, you know Silicon Valley to try to understand why is that contributing to this kind of uh, you know and I, I love TikTok it's amazing it's it's a, um, a a direct injection to my veins like you know um, uh, it, it is incredibly remarkable but it's sort of the anathema of you know sitting down and thinking about what you can do what small incremental changes you can make to yourself to your family to your community. Um, that I think you know we've we've lost a sight of on some level. I sound very conservative now, don't I? Um, but but I, I I think you know so so I think I think the 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 biggest question for me in in answer to your question, and maybe maybe this isn't the only way of thinking about it, but for me, 
the, the biggest question about how do you reinvestigate the public good is to reset our time frame. And I think that, you know, 2030, 2050 are good years in which to do that, right? Uh, these are these are kind of key climate moments. Right. Um, and so if we can start thinking about what, you know, what the space needs to look like around us, what uh, our country, what, what our hemisphere needs to do in order to make those climate goals, I think that that's a possibility of reimagining kind of the future, at least on a slightly longer time frame and a really critical one. If we mm -hmm. don't make those goals, um, we really won't have a lot of goals left to make. Sure, sure. Um, you know, so 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 I would say I would say you know how do we how do we reimagine the future in a way where we're we're thinking in those timelines, um, you know, those very specific two timelines, and I would just love to see, for instance, science fiction uh, kind of descending from intergalaxy. Uh, travel to mm. to you know to to this you know ten year or eight year and you know 20, 28 year periods because I think I think we need a vision of that and so so I think any way that we as designers or cultural people can help bring those realities into focus and different options I think that would be really really important. Great, thank you so much, Chris. Um, I would suggest that we now take questions from uh, the session participants. Anyone? And just really quickly, thank you, Ator. Your uh, these are these are beautiful questions. I really thank you. Um, uh, I, I'm, thank you. I'm awed by your intelligence and in coming up with those so quickly. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so Sophia, uh, you want to comment or ask a question to Chris? Uh, uh, you're muted. I think your microphone. Your microphone. Sorry, yeah. it was there really you go. good presentation. Really nice. Um, it reminded me of, of two things. I was really impressed. I saw The Boy of the Internet recently, the documentary on Aaron Schwartz, and uh, very sad, very upsetting to see how, you know, MIT and, and Obama ad administration dealt so badly with the, with the issue, and he was, you know, really trying to, to engage us with all the, um, the politics around the internet and knowledge. Um, um, and then, I was looking into your strategies, your joyful strategies, and reminded me of a, a Portuguese artist that said once that the most joy is the most serious thing in life. Uh, Alma Benigreiro said that uh, in the early um, 20th century. And, and so I was thinking, um, the, you know, I was also reading recently Rosie Bradati about, you know, the joyful cyber feminist. Um, and she has this really interesting article on the um, Sissy Riot uh, imagery, not only the visuals, but also the music. And I, I was wondering also um, how, um, or do you still, I think you do, because you're um, combining the, you know, your scholarly uh, research and knowledge with some activism. Um, where do you think this needs to go to be more, engage more people we really need more people to be engaged with these, um, with these topics yeah so so I, I i mean um i think uh i i want to push back on one aspect uh which is um the implicit idea that scale is somehow um you know the 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 most important aspect of some of these like i would just say that you know if you look at how many people are involved in amazon turk it's it's huge, uh, you know. It's it's uh, 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 half a million workers a, a day or something like this are involved in Amazon Turk, and then if you look at Turkopticon, it's much smaller. It's you know, uh, uh, I think I think maybe I'm I'm thinking around forty thousand a month, but what they do has proven to be a significant kind of moderator on the most negative employers on Amazon Turk, right? So, so, you know, in some cases with these small platforms, what you have to do is kind of take a step back and say, you know, how big does the platform need to be? Like, it's true that the, the general understanding of platforms is that, you know, they become Google or they become Amazon. But, you know, in some cases, a smaller platform that's leveraged correctly um, can have really disproportional effect. And so, um, you know, that that's one point. And, and depending on where you mean in terms of scale, that might not be, have been what you meant. But I just wanted to make a point that um, some of these platforms can be tremendously effective, even if they're not that big. Um, 
but then you know then to say you know in terms of the scale of who's making small platforms i think this is a a, a much more serious question um because i think that there are so many small platforms that stand to be made um uh that 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 could be necessary and they're you know they're technically complicated but they're technically like between websites and you know something more serious it, you know it, it, it's really not rocket science it's it's kind of like a lamp stack, you know, if, if anyone out there knows what those are. And, you know, you, you just, you don't need a huge amount to make them, but if you understand the, the data and the information that it's necessary for you to capture, and then also how to leverage that data into, you know, kind of longer term questions like legislation um, or litigation or some of the other kind of, you know, more traditional social ways of manipulating that data into long-term change then um you know it's it's really not incredibly complicated and and i guess i guess you know what what i'd say is probably we need a good textbook on this um <laughs> like you know uh uh you know the equivalent of you know yokai benkler's wealth of networks or something like that that's just a um an exhaustive perhaps not always correct but um you know kind of textbook that people can refer to or shrinichek's platform capitalism i i you know i i don't think i'm the right person to write it because i'm an artist but um uh and, and writing is not a huge part of my practice but i would love to see someone kind of come up with a textbook that says look um, you know, here's here's a way to think about uh, data from below in these kind of, uh, you know, interesting configurations. Here's a set of, uh, you know, kind of Harvard Business Review type um, case studies that show how to do it. And I think if you could leverage that, that's a scale that I'm much more, I love to see the scale being on the supply of small platforms rather than to think about how these platforms can scale up. Because in a lot of cases, that scaling up is not going to be the right path for them. Does that, did that answer? Yeah. Does that help? Okay. Um, Thank you, Chris. Right. Let's listen yeah. from, from Anna. So my question is a bit on the same length as uh, Sophia's. Uh, one of the things that is really cool is that Tim Nidgebru, um, you know, resonated some of what you're saying when she spoke about, you know, us needing to develop AI projects that are not extractive, that do not use this extractive logic, but rather work with communities. Um, and so, you know, I, I can see how a lot of progressive people are thinking about this, but a question that I have is, how do you engage the community or, or to put it differently, what, how do you define the problems that you're going to tackle? How have you done that? Or because you spoke about your colleagues and you're all Ivy League, and I, I don't mean this in any demeaning way, because being smart is good, but, you know, um, we're all, you know, even here, you know, we are, um, perhaps not exemplary or we're not to the people who are going to benefit most from this. So I'm wondering how we, we establish those connections to the communities whose problems we're trying to ameliorate. Um, how does that work or how have you made it work? Right. Yeah. So we've seen it work in a, a bunch of ways and, you know, it's, it's, uh, uh, I'll, I'll take one project that I didn't show, but um, uh, people can look up while we're talking, which is littlesys.org, which was, um, you know, a, a project that was done by a couple of undergrads who uh, had seen a project that we'd done and shut down and they wanted to build a better version. And so they came to us, we gave them our source code, and they eventually built this project littlesys.org, which, you know, has been running uninterrupted since I think 2010, um, you know, so it's a 12-year-old uh, small nonprofit They've hired exactly enough people to kind of keep it going. And they have, you know, they part of what they do as an organization with this software platform, they call it the involuntary Facebook of the rich and powerful. So they basically scrape a lot of web information about rich and powerful people and then put together a, um, you know, a, a node link kind of uh, data model where you can see these how these people have interacted, where they've been at the same events. Um, and very kind of quickly travel at, uh, uh, you know, a, a topography of power. Um, and people basically come there and they build, um, they build these connections based on different kinds of subjects that they're interested in. So that's a kind of a classic platform approach where they're running it. They meet some of the power users, they get them to become moderators, they get them to become helpers. But, you know, most of the people that, that are using their system very actively they never meet, they never talk to, they never have any engagement with. And so people get to decide what the problems they want to solve using the platform are, and then they use the platform for it. So that's like kind of the anonymous platform approach that, you know, could be Flickr or, you know, some other, um, you know, uh, 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 could be Tumblr or, or you know, Instagram. 
um, but in Instagram of like uh, conspiracy theories. <laughs> um, uh, but then, you know, then you have Public Lab, which, you know, is is almost antithetical, where they take everything that they do technically, they take from community-based interests on their, uh, in their, you know, in-person activities or on their, you um, uh, uh, you know, public uh, uh, kind of newsletters or or um, uh, uh, bulletin board kind of system. So people will come and say, hey, look, you know, I found your website because I know that there's hydrogen sulfide being leaked in my community. And uh, I saw that you're doing different community-oriented sensors. Do you have a community-oriented hydrogen sulfide sensor? And so what they do is they pull together other people who are on their bulletin board, you know, uh, kind of talking their mailing lists, and they say, does anyone here have, you know, uh, access to anyone who knows about hydrogen sulfide or knows about chem chemical sensing on that level? And gradually they start to pull in experts, but it always kind of starts from community engagement. And they they literally um, have these, what they call uh, barn raisings, which, you know, is, it comes from this rural tradition, not just in the United States, but all over, of when it's time to um, raise the different parts of your barn section by section and then stand them up and start putting a roof on and connecting them. You, everyone in the community comes and everyone, you know, comes to kind of help with that. And so they have these barn raising sessions around the world, which are, uh, you know, how to get the next technology off the ground and people come in person from the community that requested the problem, technical people coming from farther away. And together they spend, you know, uh, and they could call it a hackathon, but it's not a hackathon. It's, it's, it's got different values and different results that come out of it. Um, and, you know, so that's a very community engaged kind of uh, uh, project. Some of the people from Public Lab, Sarah Wiley, who's well known in the SDS community, um, uh, went on to kind of create another organization called EDGY, which basically looks at what kind of government data is available and then matches that with people who have community needs and tries to figure out how to take the kind of massive infrastructure of the environmental protection, uh, uh, you know, the EPA, and um, and and people in communities and, and make sure that the data flows to them correctly. And so that's a very interesting because it's like much more top down in the sense that they can only work with the data that the government is producing. But then what they do is they pass that back to legislators and 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 you know these legislators in Congress, in the Senate, will show slides that were created with edgy tools and you know data sets. So there are a lot of different ways of doing it is, is the answer. Um, and, uh, and you know, I, I'd say that, um, uh, you know, yes, uh, at the moment, Cornell, you know, is an Ivy League. I don't know if that's going to last. Um, but, uh, but, but, uh, but, you know, the, the, the folks who are working on public lab, for instance, were largely coming from uh, very diverse backgrounds and very few of them were, were, were Ivy League. Um, you know, and, and so, so I think there's a lot of different, you know, models for engagement. And one of the best ways to think about how, to model your small platform or your technology intervention in activism is to look at existing models of community activism, organizing those other kinds of things, and then say, how can a technology be developed through this model? Because we know that that model works and it's a, a better social model, a better uh, form of engagement than if we were to take, say, a company model, you know, or a Silicon Valley model. Thank you very much, Chris. I don't know for the contributions. If not, then I think we we can uh, call it a night. It was amazing. Um, I don't know, Ito, do you want to say uh, some last words? Uh, I my students sure. are, are um, messaging me saying that they really enjoy it. They're shy, Chris, but uh, <laughs> I'm getting that. Yeah. That's why my eyes keep focusing there because they they're uh, talking to me. And it was great. And it was an absolutely amazing talk for students. Um, it was really accessible. And uh, I like the takeaways and you know the structure. It was fantastic. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Uh, just one last very important question. How is Portugal doing? <laughs> I think Portugal is winning. So it was a win on all fronts, you know? <laughs> all right. <laughs> I can. I, I heard my kids screaming inside, and I heard my neighbor. <laughs> so that uh, tells me that Portugal is doing well. Mm -hmm. um, I want to end then by thanking Chris and thanking Aitor and thanking all of you for being here. Uh, this was, I think, the best way that I could think of for ending this series. Um, it was a really excellent talk. Um, 
it was accessible. It was, you know, filled with practical examples. It was also very much interdisciplinary, which I appreciate. Um, and I, I don't know if Aitor wants to say another kind of formal goodbye, but from my perspective, just thank you all for coming here and for being with us and for making this a fun event um, for one year, which was great. Aitor, I don't know. Sure. Thank you so much, Anna. And again, I really want to thank the whole organizing team of this series for the privilege of uh, being the moderator of this closing session. And it's such a pleasure, a pleasure to see Chris again and be inspired by his multiple projects. I just don't know how you found the time for all this, but uh, there you go. Uh, um, as a closing statement, maybe I, I would like to... Um, go back to an experience that I had a couple of years ago um, when I was uh, giving a lecture um, as a guest lecturer about uh, certain developments in in in, in salted, certain cultural developments in in the post-war so after the second world war and how precisely we kind of uh, ended up in may 68 which chris was mentioning a little while ago and the students were getting really excited about the examples the historical examples of engagement and political activism and then one of the students turned to me and said, well, it seems that it was really easy back then, but nowadays we don't really have any causes. Right? And I paused for a second because I was a bit baffled by this affirmation. Uh, what do you mean you don't have any causes? And then I realized what he was talking about. The student was saying essentially that they didn't have the tools. They didn't have the resources. They didn't feel empowered. So it was not an absence of causes. It was an absence of the infrastructure that enabled them to act. And I think in a way, that's what we see in Chris's work as a template. And uh, to echo your own words a little while ago, it's not so much about solving a specific problem as much as it is about providing the resource for people to then do it themselves. So it is about empowerment in the end. Um, so this would be my closing statement, if that's okay. Um, if not for, I think, Akin, who also has a comment. I, I don't know, Anna, it's 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 your room. So do, do we um, yeah, welcome I, Akin? Yeah, I don't know, uh, Akin, can you turn on your mic? Yeah, thank you so much. Um, well, um, I'm joining from Nigeria, and um, during the presentation of Chris, he made mention of uh, the fire outbreak in Nigeria. It sounds so <laughs> weird to me anyway. So it's a good one, and I'm so glad uh, joining this platform. Uh, yeah, going forward, I want to find out, is it possible to... Uh, is there a group um, where one can join, you know, to foster um this talk you know beyond uh, what we have here tonight so that's just my little question and then um, how do we uh strengthen uh, this aspect of uh leveraging data um in tertiary institutions especially for uh places like uh nigeria and sub-saharan africa how can we have um something we can leverage on such that um this can continue, you know, in third world nation and less developed part of the world. Thank you. Hi, I can. Um, yeah, great, great question. Uh, uh, so uh, I didn't show work uh, that I've been doing in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, it's actually while I was in Madeira in Portugal, uh, we, we hosted a conference called uh, Strategic Narratives of Technology in Africa. Um, because we find that, uh, it, to kind of paraphrase the development ICTD theorist uh, Kentaro Toyama, who I talked about, he said that, you know, we, we have to stop developing around needs and, and start developing around aspirations. Um, and so he, he's, like I see, that kind of the technology and development kind of discourse is, is already premised in, in some really problematic ways. So for um, uh, about six years, I worked with uh, uh, Ugandan telecommunications engineer Jude Mukundane um, around uh, developing uh, community radio platforms um, in Sub-Saharan Africa, and we, you know, ended up launching uh, I think about twenty stations um, through Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, you know, Cabo Verde, 
uh, Uganda, um, uh, but also Rom rural Romania, rural Ireland, um, you know, uh, as well. Um, so that's a project called rutio.org that you might want to take a look at. Um, and we're continuing this work. In particular, I'm super interested in the, the um, kind of uh, value transfer techniques that eventually became mobile money, which I think is having an impact in Nigeria as well. So I'm working on a paper with um, uh, Daniel Masugwa, uh, a doctoral candidate as well, on trying to understand how was this um, practice of exchanging airtime for value, uh, which was ubiquitous around Africa before it was commercialized, how could that have gone differently if in fact it had become a commons-based system or uh, you know, a, a, a less a, a federated system rather than being bought by you know, Safaricom or commercialized by Safaricom and a few um, big uh, uh, public telcos. So we are doing work on this area um, and there's a you know, great community of people doing this. Um, uh, I can strongly recommend looking for ICT4D conferences um, and maybe some of the sections of uh, the CHI community uh, that are working on, uh, you know, Global South issues. So people like uh, Avle, um, theorists like Clapperton Mavunga, um, uh, and then at the very, you know, most abstract level, um, you know, really great theorists like Ashila Mbembe, who comments on kind of pan-African questions around technology. So there's a there's a great there's a great field here, and uh, you know, uh, uh, I think if you look around, you'll find some amazing people working in it. Yeah, I, I'll be glad if you can connect me with her no one working on this in this part of the world, or uh, uh, people all across the world that could, uh, that one can actually connect with, you know, to better foster uh, the development of this in Nigeria majorly and uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. Great, great. Uh, happy to connect. And you can find my email on the Cornell website, Cornell University website. So. Okay. okay, Cornell University. All right. Yeah. All right, thank you so much. And take a screen capture of my name because you won't remember the spelling. Okay. Thank you, everyone, Thank you. for your time. Really grateful to be here. Thank you, Chris. Looking forward to seeing you in in the motherland soon. Thank you, everyone. Uh, uh, thank you, everyone. See you, Chris. See you soon. Heitor, muitíssimo obrigada. Obrigado, Will. Pela moderação, pelos pelos joinhos por tudo. And uh, I hope to see you in Lisbon, and I hope to see you, Chris, in Lisbon too. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.